Welcome to Edgelution 2.0. Edgelution was originally created as an answer to the COVID-19 pandemic. When the world went remote and students lost their opportunity to be in the classroom. To help prevent students from falling behind, Edgelution filled the gap for those who didn't have Wi-Fi or technology. Edgelution has supported the community for over two years, filling the educational divide through equity and access, ensuring that all students have a fair chance to learn and succeed in life. Our host is Ms. Pia Rosa, a Bronx-born and raised educator with a heart for her community. Let's start the show. The Bronx Edgelution. We are Bronx Strong. Hey everyone, welcome to Bronx Edgelution. I am your host, Pia Rosa. Bronx Edgelution, a place where we can have fun while learning together. Do we have any artists watching? The cool thing about art is that you can tell stories using pictures, through painting, through coloring, through drawing, or even sketches. Art is so great because you can use anything to create it. Everyone is an artist. Look around you. Do you have anything at home that you can use to create art? Grab a piece of paper, grab a pencil, and draw your favorite thing. So my wonderful, beautiful artists, we did try something like this uh, on my previous video. I just have a little extra space on this paper, so I'm not going to waste the paper. I want to show you how I would do a more simplified version of a lion cub. If you have a really difficult time and uh, you're frustrated that it's not coming out. So here is one a little easier, hopefully, for you. I'm looking for my markers. I'm constantly like messing around, playing around with all of my art supplies. I'm also trying to figure out a better way to position my uh, computer. You know, hopefully this will work. All right. So this time I am going to start with the eyes. I'm going to, let's see, you're going to be able to see this way, right? Oh, yeah. Now we're cooking. So eyes, one circle for the eye. Leave a little space, well, sufficient space. Another circle for the eye. Try to make them about the same size. If one is smaller than the other, well, make it bigger. <laughs> so it's not as small. I love leaving the white bubbles when I'm doing cartoon-like characters white bubbles and one white crescents so the upper part of the circle has a small bubble and the lower part is a crescent and then i color in the rest of the eyeball leaving the bubble and the crescent white Ta-da! Already looking cute. Um, I am thinking that perhaps if I start with, with something that you've done before, doing the arch for the top of the head and then the ears, maybe that will help you. So here it is, almost like a little sad face above the eyes. Try to make sure that it's like on the same level. Mm -hmm. A rounded ear, a rounded ear. Like I'm starting the rainbow, but I'm not quite finished. And I'm kind of bring it down, bring it down. Make sure you have enough distance on the side of the eyes, right? 
Now step down. Do the best you can with the nose. I'm going to curve the nose so it will look more 3D. And create that triangular shape with, well, curved sides. So it's not a true triangle. True triangle has straight sides. That would be a math shape. But this sort of kind of reminds me because it's pointy at the base. And again, I'm going to make my nostrils like this on the sides of these letters V. If it doesn't come out like this, just make a um, triangle that points down. And uh, hopefully that will look good. Go chubby little cheek to the left, chubby little cheek to the right. Straight from that pointy part of the nose. Chubby little cheek, chubby little cheek. And shade in this area, in between the chubby cheeks. Cute. Go down. Under the nose. Make a kind of like a straight line. About the same length as the nose. And now connect it smoothly to the chubby little cheeks. Go out a little bit more from the ears. Go out a little bit more and then bring the curve in to that jawline where we stopped just now. How cute, right? I will double up the curve of the ear on the left and the right, just like this. I will add the zigzag for the fur. looking pretty good the eyes are too round i mean you can leave it like this or you can try to just sort of go down towards the nose like this like this just a line stretching out i think it will be a better improvement good improvement but now here go up so it's more a cartoonish way of making lion eyes i'm very good at that and i feel like you've got more of a sense of the lion face immediately just by adding that maybe a few dots couple of whiskers, okay. A little bit of fur. Looking good. I'm going to turn this wild cat um, the same way like I did the um, lion cub on this artwork so the back is gonna go here and the chest is gonna go here start where your jawline and your cheekbone meet and go zigzag 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 down and then draw one side of the paw much like this one Step a little bit uh, to the side, going closer to the center of the face. Make another line, one paw. 
continue with the zigzag. Make another line. That's going to be the second pawn. And another line. So one leg, two legs. One line, two lines, one leg. One line, two lines, two legs. Let's see if I can show you how I make pause cartoon-like. So I'll start here. Right in the middle, I'm going to make a big rainbow and I close it in with a curve. So it's like an oval. One more time. A rainbow and close it in. This one is smaller. Let's do just three. Just three. It will still look good. Here we go. Watch me again. I'm going to put right in the middle of this leg. I'm going to put whoa rainbow. And I close it in with the curve. Then attach another rainbow and another rainbow and close it with curves. Looking pretty good, right? I will probably add a little bit of fur here so we have the chest and the belly. Now I'm going to add another paw right here, right after I create the hip. So watch what I'm gonna do. See this rainbow? So from here, ignoring the actual feet, I'm going to go up, 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 and I'm going to connect lower than the eye, this cheekbone, almost in the same level with the nose. Here it is. Don't go too high. Don't go close to the ear, okay? Because that will be too high. Now I'm going to create a little wrinkle right here for the hip. And I need the heel and the toes. So whoosh. One toe, like a little hook. Two toes, like a little hook. They're being overlapped by this leg. And then fit in the tail. The best you can. Let me see. One line, two lines. They form the, the two sides of the tail. And almost, this reminds me of like a paintbrush bristle, right? The end of the tail. That's your cute, a cute little line. I feel like this cheek is a little pointier, right? Maybe I should make this cheek a little more pointy. Better, right? Sometimes by looking at the screen, what you're seeing, I realize what I might want to do. Over here, I might want to add a little bit of like zigzag. So looks like more, more fur. Oh yeah. That's up to you if you want a few more zigzags. Don't overdo it so it doesn't look like um too fuzzy, just enough. And then you can color. You can use your yellow and your brown, both light and dark. Create a cute little pinkish nose, right? Fill in the eyes. And maybe even create a background for them. Maybe they're sitting on rocks. Maybe they're sitting. On rocks. Line of the horizon behind them. A small little lines for the shrubs. Those can be green. Right? 
I'm just making curly, rounded lines. Planning that this is going to be green. I love using crayons for this, and I, as you know, I use crayons that have no paper. This is my green color. I put it on the side, prep claw, and just slide. It only works if the crayon does not have a paper. Maybe your moms and dads, or older brothers and sisters can help you remove paper from some of your broken crayons. I always use my broken crayons. Yes. Okay. Pick it up. And if you have black, and you press very lightly, it will come out nice and gray, so that will be the rock. Press a little harder and it's black. Let's press a little white and it's gray. Sometimes I use my left hand, sometimes I use my right hand. Depends. My right hand is tired. I switch. <laughs> there you go. Make sure you finish the color of your lion cut. Create the beautiful blue sky. Right? And it looks more realistic. Even if it is a more cartoon like character, it still looks good. All right, I hope you enjoyed this second installment for the Lion Club. Enjoy and practice, and I will see you real soon, my friends. Don't give up, right? Do your very best. I'm very proud of you. See you soon. Bye. The Bronx Edulution. We are Bronx Strong. Have you ever visited a special place? On Bronx Edulution, we're going to be taking lots of virtual tours. A virtual tour is when you get to visit fun and special places online. This week, take your family on a virtual tour. The best part about it is that it's free and you get to choose the destination. Welcome to Loose Gravel, the travel show, where we explore various countries and their cultures. This program is brought to you by BronxNet. And I'm your host, Miss Merville. As a global citizen, it is your responsibility to be open-minded to different cultures and customs different from your own. It's important to also know about social issues that occur in the world so that you can understand all that makes people so unique. On this episode of Loose Gravel, we will briefly explore some basic facts about a particular country. We will then explore cultural practice and will create our own interpretation of this practice through a hands-on activity. Hope you're ready. Here's some key vocabulary to look out for. Good readers look out for context clues to help them gain meaning of an unknown word. Here are some words that you will learn about in this video lesson. Brazil, carnival, colonizers, cultural practice, intricate, Rio de Janeiro, samba, sambodromo, and technique. Keep an eye out for these words.
Brazil is located in South America. It's bordered by nine countries. Let's jump into some more fascinating facts about the fifth largest country in the world, Brazil. The population of Brazil is 211 million. Portuguese is the official language. Hola means hello. The name Brazil comes from a tree called Brazil wood. And the weather in Brazil is typically hot and humid. Brazil is a beautiful country with a rich history and exciting culture. The people of Brazil are very friendly as well. The capital of Brazil is Brasilia. Brasilia is the city where the president lives and works. It's also where a majority of the governmental agencies are located. The flag of Brazil has three colors. The green represents the forest of Brazil. The blue represents the starry sky over Rio de Janeiro. And finally, the yellow represents the mineral wealth of the country. Also, across the flag, it says Orden e Progreso, which means order and progress. Brazil is the fifth largest country in the world and has a variety of landscapes like the jungle, forests, grasslands, and more. These landscapes are home to many ecosystems. The Amazon rainforest is the most notable landscape of the country. The rainforest once covered the southeastern portion of Brazil. Today, it is home to Brazil's largest cities, such as Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. What is a cultural practice? As you've learned in our other videos, culture is a pattern of behavior that is shared by a society or group of people. And many different things make up a society's culture. A cultural practice would be any of these actions performed by members of that group. And here are some examples. Arts, beliefs, food, language, music, clothing, customs, and holidays. Which cultural practice will we explore today? Holidays. Let's explore Carnival in Brazil. Carnival in Brazil. Carnival, pronounced Carnival, is the most popular festival in Brazil. Nearly 5 million people take part in celebrating this festival in the city of Rio de Janeiro. It is celebrated each spring on the Saturday before Ash Wednesday, which is the first day of fasting in Christianity. This is usually about 40 days before Easter. The party takes place in almost every corner of most Brazilian cities. The local people welcome tourists to take part in the celebrations. Carnival in Brazil has a unique style. The immigrant slaves heavily influenced the festival with their spectacular musical abilities. The African slaves were brought to Brazil by the Portuguese colonizers. A colonizer is a person who uses force to take control of an area or a country that is not their own and sends people from their own country to live there. The African slaves gave birth to the first samba rhythms. Samba is a fun, upbeat, and lively dance with a great deal of rhythm due to the quick drum beats. What takes place during Carnival? During the festival, there are many parties, festivals, and parades in the streets of many Brazilian cities. The Samba School Parade is the main attraction of the four-day event. There are more than 100 Samba schools in Rio alone. The ultimate goal of Carnival. About 3,000 performers wear intricate costumes full of glitter, colors, and feathers. They pay so much attention to detail from their masks to their dance routines to the enormous floats. They dance down the parade alongside spectacular floats into the Sambodromo, an avenue that was built to host the Carnival Parade. Different Samba schools compete with each other for the title of Carnival Champion. The performance of each school has its own routine and parade float with a certain theme, such as politics, art, music, or sport. 
It takes several months to practice and the performers put in a lot of hard work before the actual carnival. A set of jurors decide which groups of dancers will be awarded with a prize. It's your turn. It's your turn to create your own mask in preparation for the Brazilian cultural event, Carnival. Let's create a mask. How might you make an ornate carnival mask? How could we incorporate elements of our own cultures into our carnival creation? Let's dive into the materials and the steps necessary to make your very own carnival mask. Don't work alone, make it a family extravaganza. Here are some of the materials you might need to create your own mask for Carnival. You'll need scissors, construction paper or cardstock, glue stick, glitter, and maybe some string you have hanging around. Here's our task. Cut out a mask pattern and spaces for the eyes using scissors. Using construction paper or cardstock, cut out feathers. You will need a few, so feel free to use different colors to make your mask vibrant. Three, use a glue stick to put the feathers all around the mask. Four, attach the string around each side of the mask using a stapler or a hole puncher. Use a pencil to curl the feathers around the mask to add dimension. And finally, add some glitter to give your mask more pizzazz. And voila, you've created a mask worthy of a championship at the Samba Dromo. Let's go over our recap checklist. We learned a few key facts about Brazil and its geography. We identified a few cultural practices and used context clues to define key vocabulary words. We explored the holiday that is Carnival through text and other media. We examined the materials to create a mask and created our own interpretation using our own culture as inspiration. We took a retrospective look at our experience today by completing this checklist. We'd love to see your creations. Send your pictures, videos, reels, or TikToks of your carnival mask to our Instagram. Show off what you made. Be sure to tag us at Loose Gravel Travel. See you next time. The Bronx has a new story. A story of community, legacy, empowerment, and strength. Our borough stands united with leaders on the front lines of service, putting families first, making sure there's equity for all. Experience culture, experience community, experience our new story. We are Bronx Strong. Hi. Today, our learning objective is how can we determine central ideas in a nonfiction text? Remember, 
when we determine possible central ideas, we use pop-out sentences and headings. We locate details across sections and think, how do these details fit together? So we have right here on the screen, a fork, a knife, and a spoon. Let's think about how these details fit together. Well, they, they are made out of metal and they're all utensils that you can use to eat. But what if I add more items? How do these details fit together? Well, all of these items can be used to cook and can be found in a kitchen. Are you ready to, to try it out one more time? Okay, here we have three different animals. How do these details fit together? Let's think about it. Oh, they're all parenting, that's right. Well, sometimes when we're reading our nonfiction texts, we may find many details that seem relevant and pop out at us, and we have to gather them and think, how do these details fit together? I'm gonna read out loud an excerpt from a very popular book, Fast Food Nation. And I want you to jot down important details as you listen, Details that pop out at you or seem important. Are you ready for the reading? Selling more soda to kids has become one of the easiest ways to meet sales projections. Influencing elementary school students is very important to soft drink marketers. An article in January, an article in the January 1999 issue of Beverage Industry explained, because children are still establishing their tastes and habits, eight-year-olds are considered ideal customers. They have about 65 years of purchasing in front of them. Entering the schools makes perfect sense the trade journal concluded. So I want you to just stop right here and jot down an important detail or something that stood out to you from this first paragraph. Take one minute to do so. I hope that you wrote down your important detail. Now we're moving on to the second paragraph. The fast food chain also benefit enormously when children drink more soda. The chicken nuggets, hamburgers, and other main courses sold at fast food restaurants usually have the lowest profit margins. And other main courses, soda, has by far the highest. We at McDonald's are thankful, a top executive once told the New York Times that people like drinks with their sandwiches. Today, McDonald's sells more Coca-Cola than anyone else in the world. The fast food chains purchase Coca-Cola syrup for about $4.25 a gallon, a medium Coke, that sells for $1.29 contains roughly nine cents worth of syrup. Buying a large Coke for $1.49 instead, as the cute girl behind the counter always suggests, will add another three cents worth of syrup and another 17 cents in pure profit for McDonald's. 
Now stop here and jot. Important details or sentences that stood out to you. Now stop and gather all of your details and let's ask ourselves, how do these details fit together? Now let's look at these three details. Soda companies sell a Coke for $1.29 that only cost them nine cents to make. That's my first detail. Another detail that stood out to me that was important was influencing elementary schoolers is really important for the soda companies. And last, eight-year-olds are ideal customers for soda companies. And we're going to ask ourselves, how do these details fit together? And here's a tip. You can ask yourself, what's the subject? And the subject of all of the details is drinking soda. So then what does the author reveal about these details? Well, fast food companies market their products to kids so that they can make more money. And essentially, this becomes our central idea. Great job today helping me find the central idea what I want you to do is I want you to grab your favorite nonfiction book or an article and jot down important details as you read. Think about how these details fit together to find the central idea. Good job today. See you next time. I felt like I just wanted to make more of an impact on children, especially in the Bronx. I'm super passionate about children in the Bronx because I feel like we're the underdogs. And unfortunately, sometimes I think we're overlooked, but I just feel like the children here are like superstars, honestly. Like the spirit of the Bronx is just something you can't even describe. So I just wanted to make more of an impact on students and also in school buildings. So I was fortunate enough to be offered a great opportunity by my mentor um, to work here. Hello there, I'm Ms. Perez Lightborn, and our learning objective for today is I can participate in a read out loud and practice summarizing. What is a summary? A summary is a condensed or shortened retelling of a longer work. This can be a movie, a book, a play, a long poem, and so forth. It gives a person who has not read the story or book a good idea of what the book will be about. Summaries. They begin with a lead, which includes the title, author, and text type, include important story elements, character setting events, if summarizing an entire text, the central idea or theme of the text may also be included. Summaries are written in chronological order and mirror how the text itself unfolds. Summaries are free from opinion or judgment. Summaries are significantly shorter than the original text and therefore do not include minor facts or details. And summaries do not typically include direct quotations. Today, we're gonna to write a summary of a mentor text that I would model, and then you're gonna do this work on your own. To write a summary of your reading, first, you read the text, then you reflect on your reading, trying to recall the important information or events that stick with you after a first reading. You reread the text and highlight important elements and ideas that should potentially be included in a summary. You formulate the lead. You include the most important information and events in chronological order. And finally, you check that the summary is reflective of the text 
and not your own opinions. You ready to do this work today? Today, we're going to read Popularity by Adam Bagdasarian. We're going to listen closely, and then we're going to write a summary. Are you ready? Somewhere inside me, I knew that 10-year-old boys were not supposed to spend their recess circling oak trees in search of four-leaf clovers. Still, that's what I and my equally unpopular acquaintances, Alan Gold and Alan Shipman, were doing while the rest of our classmates played tag and kickball and pushed each other higher and higher on the swings. Aside from having a little more than our share of baby fat, the two Allens and I had very little in common. In fact, we could barely stand one another. Still, during recess, we were the only company we had, so we tried to make the best of it. Now and then, one of us would bend forward, pick a clover, examine it, shake his head, and let it fall to the ground. Got one, Alan Gold said. Let's see, Alan Shipman said. Alan showed Alan the clover. That's only three. No, that's four right here, see? That's not a whole leaf, Alan Shipman said sourly. There's one leaf, two leaves, three leaves, four leaves. That's not a whole leaf. We have been looking for four leaf clovers every school day for six months. And each of us knew exactly what he would do if he ever found one. He would hold a lucky clover tight in his hands close his eyes and wish he was so popular that he would never have to spend time with the other two again. Got one, Alan Shipman said. Alan Gold swiped the clover from him. One, two, three, he said, throwing it to the ground. There's four there. That was a four leaf clover. Pick it up, you pick it up, you pick it up, you, you. While the Allens faced off, I looked across the black tar and asphalt at a crowd of boys who were making more noise and seemed to be having more fun than anyone else on the playground. These were the popular boys, and in the center of this group stood their leader, Sean Owens. Sean Owen was the best student in the fourth grade. He was also one of the humblest, handsomest, strongest, fastest, most clear-thinking 10-year-olds that God has ever placed on the face of the earth. Sean Owens could run a 50-yard dash in six seconds, hit a baseball 200 feet, and throw a football 40 yards. The only thing Sean didn't have was a personality. He didn't need one. When you can hit a baseball 200 feet, all you have to do is round the bases and wait for the world's adulation. I gazed at Sean and the rest of the popular boys in bewildered admiration. It seemed like only yesterday that we had all played kickball, dodgeball, and basketball together. And then one morning, I woke up to find that this happy democracy had devolved into a monarchy of kings, queens, dukes, and duchess, lords, and ladies. It did not take a genius to know that. Upon the continent of this playground, the two Allens and I were stable boys. I had been resigned to my rank for many months, but now looking at the two Allens still arguing over the same three leaf clover, then at the popular voice, I suddenly knew that I could not stand another day at the bottom. I wanted to be part of the noise and the laughter. I wanted, I needed to be popular. Being 10 years old, I did not question this ambition, but I did wonder how on earth I was going to realize it. Though I only stood 20 yards from the heart of the kingdom, I felt a thousand miles removed from the rank and prestige of its citizens. How could I bridge such a gap, knowing I might be stared at or laughed at or belittled to a speck of so small that I could no longer be seen by the naked eye? And as I stood on the playground, torn between fear and ambition, those 20 yards began to recede from the view, and I knew that I must either step forward now or retreat forever 
to a life of bitter companions and three-leaf clovers. I took a deep breath and then, with great trepidation, crossed the 20 longest yards I have ever walked in my life and found myself standing a few feet from the outer circle of what I hoped was my destiny. I lowered my head a little so as not to draw attention to myself and watched and listened. Mitch Brockman, a lean, long-faced common comic considered by many to be the funniest boy in the fourth grade, was in the middle of a story that had something to do with Tijuana and a wiener mobile. I wasn't sure what the story was about, but there was a lot of body English and innuendo, all of which the crowd seemed to find absolutely hilarious. I noticed that every time Mitch said something funny, he eyed Sean Owens to see if he was laughing. He was, silently. His mouth was open, but it was the laughter of the other boys that filled the silence. I realized then that Mitch was Sean's gesture. As long as he could make Sean laugh, he was assured a prominent position in the group. I wonder where my position in the group might be. I certainly wasn't a great athlete, student, or ladies' man, but I did have a sense of humor. Maybe I could be the second funniest boy in the fourth grade. My thoughts went no further because the bell ending recess rang. But that night, just before I fell asleep, I saw myself standing in the center of the popular boys, telling the funniest stories anyone have ever heard. I saw Sean Owens doubled up with laughter. I saw myself triumphant. I returned to the group every recess. For three days, I stood unnoticed just outside the outer circle, waiting for my moment, for the one joke or wise crack that would make me popular. I knew that I would only get one chance to prove myself and that if I failed, I would be sent back to the stables. And so, with the single-mindedness of a scientist, I listened to the jokes the other boys made, hoping to align my comic sensibilities with theirs. Now and then, I found myself on the verge of saying something, but every time I opened my mouth, Mitch would launch into another routine and my moment passed, and I had to resign myself to yet another day in the dark. I did not know that popularity has a lifespan, and that Mitch time was about to run out. It is a sad fact of life that the clothes a child wears and how he wears them often determines his ranks in school society. I knew it, Sean Owens knew it, everyone in the school knew it, so maybe it was carelessness or temporary insanity or a subconscious desire to step back into the stress-free shadow of anonymity that caused Mitch Brockman to wear a yellow shirt with a yellow pair of pants. He might have gotten away with it if I hadn't left for school that same morning, unaware that one folded cuff of my jeans was noticeably lower than the others, and it was. The two of us were on a collision course that only one of us would survive. At recess on that fateful day, I took my customary place a foot from the popular boys, wondering if I would ever get a chance to prove myself and listen to Mitch tell another variation of his story about the Wienermobile. I pretended to enjoy the story as much as the others, while my mind strayed to a dream world where I did not have to feel so out of place and Mitch and Sean and I were best friends. And then, with a sudden that jared me into, back to reality, Mitch Brockman, a boy who had never noticed me, never seemed to know or care that I was alive, turned to me, pointed at my uneven pants and said, someone needs a ruler. This was perhaps the wittiest remark he had ever made, and I froze. With four words, he had devastated all my aspirations, defined me as a fool, and all but condemned me to a life of shame and obscurity. 
I could see my future, my boyhood itself crumbling to dust. And as I heard laughter and felt the heat of the spotlight upon me, I pointed at Mitch yellow pants and shirt and said, someone else needs a mirror. You look like a cannery. Then with the grace of a magician's assistant, I raised my left arm in a presidential gesture and said, boys, I give you Tweety Bird. And it was all over. As the volume of the laughter doubled, Mitch seemed to vanish. And that day on that playground, Sean always laughter was heard for the first time. In an instant, Mitch Brockman became Tweety Bird and I, and absolutely none in tea, became somebody. And then somebody special, someone to seek out, someone to follow. Sean Owen's first gesture and best friend. The entire transformation was complete in a matter of months. During this time, Mitch became a less and less vocal part of the group, telling fewer and fewer stories until finally, the following year, he was gone. To another school, perhaps, or another state, or another country, I never knew. No one knew, because no one noticed. No one had called him for months, but my phone rang. My weekends were filled with sleepovers and baseball games and bowling parties and bi bicycle races and more new friends that I knew what to do with. And I did not trust one of them because I knew then that I was standing on sand and was only a yellow shirt and pair of pants away from the oak trees where the two Allens were still looking for four leaf clovers. Using the steps that I mentioned earlier, here's an example of the summary. In the short story, Popularity by Adam Bagdasarian, a boy named Will wants to be popular. He and his acquaintances spend time circling trees looking for four leaf clovers. As he spends his recess circling trees, he fantasizes about becoming popular. He admires Sean Owen's popularity. Will closely observes the popular kids in the playground and develops techniques as to how to fit in with the popular kids. On one particular day, he makes fun of Mitch and calls him Tweety Bird. The whole playground laughed. Finally, Will was recognized and became popular. So today you're gonna to use these same steps. You're gonna select a short story. You can use the Sora app and apply the strategies that you have learned today. So let's review. To write a summary of your reading, read the text, reflect on your reading, trying to recall the important information or events that stick with you after a first reading. Reread the text and highlight important elements and ideas that should potentially be included in a summary. Formulate the lead. Include the most important information and events in chronological order. And check that the summary is reflective of the text and not of your own opinions. Take care and have fun. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Wasn't that so much fun? I really do enjoy reading together and I hope you do too. I love reading about different parts of the world. Do you? Let's read another one. See you next time. Hello, my name is Mr. John. Today I'm going to read a math book. Now what? A math tale. By Robbie Harris. Wow, blocks, lots and lots of blocks. Hey bear, this one's long. Long enough for a snooze? Wide enough? Look, one, two, three, four corners. One, two, three, four, straight lines. Two are long, two are short. Hey, this is a rectangle. A rectangle on top and a rectangle on the bottom, upside down, downside up. It's still a rectangle. 
Surprise, every side's a rectangle. Hey, it's a rectangle block. Oops, too short for a snooze. Too short for me, too skinny. Okay, I need one more long one, just like this one. Oh no, there is only one rectangle block. Yikes! Well, maybe this one? Look, one, two, three, four corners. One, two, three, four straight lines, all the same size. Hey, this is a square. Whoa, a rectangle has one, two, three, four straight lines and one, two, three, four corners. Oh, this is a rectangle that's square. And there's a square on top and a square on the bottom. Upside down, downside up, it's still a square. And it's still a rectangle that's square. Surprise, every side is a rectangle. So it's a rectangle block that's a square block too. What if, nope, still too short, Way too short for a snooze. One more? One more square block? Yep, long enough. Nope, too skinny, not wide enough. Too skinny for me. I need more square blocks now. Oh no! No more rectangle blocks? No more square blocks? Now what? Oh, more blocks with one, two, three corners. One, two, three straight lines. Hey, they're triangle blocks. Look, triangle on top, triangle on the bottom, Upside down, downside up. Surprise, it's still a triangle. Okay, one big triangle block right here. One more big triangle block here. One small triangle block and one more small triangle block here. One more small triangle block and one more right here. Long enough for me. Now it's wide enough. Hey, I made a bed. Surprise, it's a rectangle bed. Oh, two more blocks. One more rectangle block, one more triangle block. Done. I'm so tired now. So very tired. Dog tired. Okay, bear. Snooze time. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Now what? A math tale. See you next time. Bronx Evolution. We are Bronx Strong.